everybody, I'm Dennis Daly. I spent 20 years with United Press International, most of it with the old UPI radio network. And my favorite assignment was going on the road producing and hosting American Montage. It was an hour-long weekly program. Now here's an edited version of one of those shows. Hi again, everybody, and this week's show starts out with a quiz. What is this the sound of? Well, it's an old-fashioned treadle sewing machine. If you're unfamiliar with the term, let me take you back to a time before electricity, when people sat at sewing machines pumping a pedal up and down, a little platform. That is what ran the sewing machine. As a matter of fact, in my hometown in Indiana, my dentist, with the unlikely name of Dr. Smiley, whose father and grandfather were dentists, had an old treadle-operated drill in the corner. How slow that must have been. The history of the sewing machine. More complex, more fun, and more vitally interesting than you might have thought. On this week's American Montage. In the heart of Arlington, Texas, which is that wonderful city nestled between Dallas and Fort Worth, where, well, the ballpark is there, for example, and Six Flags, the wonderful amusement park, the original one is there, in a house, a man named Frank has the most wonderful sewing machine museum. This is the 30th year that Frank Smith has shown people the history of the sewing machine, the evolution of a piece of machinery that absolutely revolutionized the way the world lives. Frank took me through his house, crammed to the gills with every conceivable type of sewing machine you never want to see. Frank, a couple of months ago I was in San Francisco and I was in the loft of a big building watching clothing being made. It was a special show. A woman and her sister uh, had begun to design clothing for kids with Down syndrome. They realized that their body proportions are a little different. I had never seen row after row after row of women and men sitting sewing before. As I come in and look at this, and I know from what this says on the wall, your patron saint is Elias Howe. Mm -hmm. Before that man, Elias Howe, got it in his mind to build a machine that would sew, and we so blasely call it the sewing machine, mm -hmm. all of that was done by hand up until the year about what? Yes, uh, actually the first uh, practical type sewing machine for garment making was uh, patented by Elias Howe in 1846, and it is amazing to think that maybe a thousand years on earth, women sewed with needle and thread. And that was it. And there was nothing, nothing at all to help them? No, uh, there was uh, many attempts by people in different countries, but no one came across with anything fully patented and fully workable, usable for societies until Elias Howe. Frank, tell us a little bit about how, where he was from. Was, was he an engineer as a background, a banker? How did he get interested in, in trying to perfect a machine to sew? Uh, Elias Howe was born in Spencer, Massachusetts, and uh, he was a farmer's son, but he didn't do well on the farms. He went on to Boston, and he conceived the idea of watching his wife in, at night actually sewing with needle and thread, and just like probably many men were watching women and wanting to come across with something, but didn't know of any attempts before him. It looks just to be a, just a, the picture of simplicity. Or very simplicity, but it, but it, remember, even uh, this machine was 1864, but it still had the basic essential parts, even with a machine equal to 1930s. Still did the same thing, a straight stitch with, needle and th with, with the top needle carrying the thread and a bobbin to tie with the top thread. Uh, go through it slowly, but try to explain to us how the magic happens. Okay, uh, the needle from the top, brings the thread down. Now there's thread on both sides of the needle as it goes down. And, and when the needle reaches the bottom and starts upward, it throws off a loop, a slack loop. And that's when the bullet shuttle, for instance like this type, a boat shuttle with a bullet end, that sharp end is what actually grabs the uh, uh, thread. Unlike a hand needle mm -hmm. where the, ho the eye of the needle is at the top, right. with a sewing machine it's down at the point. So it's shoving a loop of thread down. through the cloth. Right, through the cloth. And that was Elias Howe's uh, patent and uh, his idea of doing that. And, and uh, when it gets down there and the sharp pointed part of the boat shuttle grabs through the thread, uh, there's fingers that actually hold on each end of this bobbin shuttle. And now remember, they're not connected. 
only one pushes and the other one is loose as it's pushing and then going backwards the other end pushes and the other end is not loose I mean it's loose so, okay, so it's, 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 it's separating the loop right so it's, it's widening out that loop of thread it's, that's pushed through the through yeah. the cloth right that's part of it but then the loop of the thread then travels over and around the shuttle till it gets to the very end and then it drops off okay and, and comes in and then it pulls with slack up into the material time with the top thread. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what to compare that to. It would be like putting maybe a weight on the end of a piece of rope in a way and throwing it through a hoop of, ex ex of thread. Exactly. So in which we're getting the, the, the second piece of thread through a loop that's formed just for a split second. Right, and rem remember inside this uh, shuttle casing there's a uh, bobbin uh, uh, that is holding thread that it reels off of. So it's mm -hmm. like another spool of thread inside matching with okay, the top. Okay, now in this old machine, mm -hmm. the, 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 the bobbin, if I could compare it, looks like a little tiny football, actually no bigger, say, than the biggest pill a, a pharmacist might give you. Maybe <laughs> what we'd call a horse capsule. That's on this one, yes. But the ones I'm used to mm -hmm. seeing in the modern machines, the, the, the bobbin is actually a visible separate spool of thread. Yes, you can see the, uh, well, some of the modern... This would not hold as much, would it? Um, not quite as much. Uh, well, it may on some of the long bob long shuttles, because some of them were a lot larger than others. Ah, okay. Elias House first type was actually about an inch and a half long, so it was a pretty good size one with the bobbin inside. Now, this machine dates from the Civil War. Obviously, no electricity, no machinery. You crank it. Who, what uh, What brand is this? Uh, this one is called the Buckeye, and they're uh, quite scarce. It's the only one I've ever found. There was a later Buckeye made, but this is the early model from around Civil War time, and it was made actually in Cleveland, Ohio. Hence the Buckeye. Right. right. So <laughs> Let's talk about you. I understand that you got into the business of, of collecting antique and historic sewing machines actually to provide an incentive for people to buy your new machine. Uh, exactly. In the uh, early 60s, as a new home dealer, uh, I, I actually did set in an uh, old new home treadle so that people would see and convince them how old new home was because most people said, well, this is a new company. I don't want to buy that. But, but uh, So it helped my sales. And then I started actually decorating the corner of the old things with other associated items, and people started drawing to that corner. So that was the nucleus of the beginning of my collecting, basically. Now, when I was a kid in Indiana, my dentist and uh, uh, Judy Ramos from the uh, from Arlington City of I started to say Arlington County because I live in Arlington County, Virginia, uh -huh. from the city of Arlington who arranged this trip, uh, and I were talking about the fact that my first dentist was named Doctor Smiley, believe it or not, oh. and his father had been a dentist, and his father before him, and in the corner he had an old drill with the the pantograph arms and the little pulleys that was a treadle. You oh, pumped it more yeah. or less, and I was thinking how slow. That must have been. But that was the way you sewed. And, and, and uh, I can remember my grandmother sitting there running her foot up and down. Uh, and we have, we have to remember that many parts of this country did not have electricity till the 1940s. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, I was one of the ones out in the country even in the 50s that still didn't have, in Arkansas, didn't have electricity till 58, you know. So I, I would think that before the coming of electricity, there must have been, is it an over-exaggeration to say there were millions of sewing machines made? Yes, there was. But you, you have to remember in the beginning, though, when Elias House started and even when Singer started a few years later, and different companies, they were really made by hand, by, by a few people making them. There was no mass production until the mid-1850s. And, and, uh, but yeah, later on in the 1880s, there was actually a million sewing machines being made on up there. This is my 30th year and uh, 18 years of showing as a public museum but uh, in different locations. We'll have to come back 10 years from now and see how many more you have. You're going to run out of space. Well I've got uh, over 300 now and I, I'm showing 150 something of them so I don't have a room for the ones I have really. Frank thanks for having us in this week. Well thank you I appreciate it. And there you have it, another edited episode of one of the American Montage programs prepared for the UPI Radio Network back in the 1980s and 90s. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for listening. Thanks for going with me this week. And check YouTube for more American Montage programs.